Good afternoon, class. Here's an exam for review. Part three covering sections 5.2 and 5.3. 5.3, the definite integral. 5.3 FTC, the fundamental theorem of calculus. Suppose a continuous function f is defined on the interval of two. The interval is divided into n subintervals. Delta x equals b minus a over n, and x sub zero is a. X sub one is a plus delta x, all the way to x sub n, which is a plus n delta x. This would be a. This would be b. A Riemann sum associated with f is the following sum. The definite integral of a to b f of x dx, which is a number, by definition is equal to the limit of this Riemann sum, summation of f of x by delta x as i goes from one to n, as n approaches infinity. Now this part, this part is the same as this part, which is f of x of one delta x all the way to f of x of n delta x, but we have to take a limit of that. Where delta x defined as b minus a over n, and x sub i is a plus i delta x, and x sub i is any point in the subinterval of a sub i minus one and a sub i. As you recall, we looked at the left end points, the right end points, the midpoints. None of them matters because it's an approximation and it becomes exact when we take a limit. So let y equals f of b a continuous function f of x. Let y equals f of x be a continuous and non-negative uh, over an interval of a to b. Definite integral is the limit as n approaches infin in infinity. Equal equivalently, you can say delta x approaching zero. Of the Riemann sum of the areas of uh, rectangles under the graph of y equals f of x over the interval of a to b. And that is the precise definition of the area under the curve as long as the function is uh, continuous and non-negative otherwise it becomes uh, the difference of areas first let's explain what this is by looking at every part of that starting with this integration symbol. The symbol, which looks like an S, was introduced by Leibniz and is called an integral sign. It is an elongated S and was chosen because an integral is a limit of sums. A is the lower limit of integration. B is the upper limit of integration. F of X is called the integrand. And dx, we call it a variable of integration, also known as a dummy variable. Why is that? It is called a dummy variable because the answer doesn't depend on the variable chosen. The dx simply indicates that the independent variable is x. The integral of a to b f of x dx is a number. It doesn't depend on x. We should use any letter in place of x without changing the value of the integral. For example, the integral of a to b f of t dt or f of x dx means the same thing. Or it's approximation. The approximation is the Riemann sum, the summation of f of x sub i delta x as i goes from 1 to n, which is f of x sub 1 times delta x all the way to f of x sub n times delta x. This sum is called a Riemann sum. The precise value is when we take a limit of this as n goes to infinity. We want to express this expression as an integral on the interval of zero to pi. Recall, we are saying the integral of f of x dx as it goes from a to b is the limit of this Riemann sum as n goes to infinity. So that represents the area under the curve as long as it's non-negative and it's continuous. So first and foremost, let us compare. So we are going to put this next to it. So compare these two. 
clearly a and b mean zero and pi. So a is zero, b is pi. But if you compare this, this is delta x, this is f of x sub i. So if this is f of x sub i, f of x must be x cubed plus x sine x. We've already discussed the interval of a to b, a to b. And so therefore, this is this integral, the integral of zero to pi, a to b, f of x, which is x cubed, plus x sine, sine x times dx. Remember, delta x is replaced by dx. So compare and come up with the answer. We want to express as an integral on the interval of 0 to 2 pi. Obviously, this is a, this is b. And we are going to compare. So A, B. Delta X is B minus A over N. to pi minus zero over here. X sub i is A plus i delta x. Replace the A with zero. Basically that's nothing. I times delta x or two pi over n or two pi i over n. So f of x sub i is this. This is f of x sub i. So f of x must be sine x in the interval of zero to two pi. Again, all you have to do, replace this with this, and it gives you back. So this is the reverse process, everybody. So the integral of f of x, which is sine x, dx from a to b, 0 to 2 pi. So pretty straightforward. Use summation formulas to compute this. The integral of zero to two, one minus x squared dx. And we remember that the integral of a to b f of x dx is this limit. Now, using the limit, as we did it with uh, differentiation, that's the start, everybody. And uh, that is pretty tedious. I want you to know that. Ultimately, we take the easy way out, which is the FTC, Fundamental Theorem of Calculus, okay? We will use that later on, but for now, we are going to use that just to get us started, everyone. So, This is the function f of x. From 0 to 2, a is 0, b is 2. So that's to get us started. 
delta x is b minus a over n, so two minus zero over n. X sub i is a zero plus i times delta x, so it makes it two i over n. We want to evaluate the limit here. So for now, let's just go with the summation. Let's look at the summation and then we take a limit finally. So first, let's simplify this part, everybody. First, let's write it and simplify it. So summation of f of x sub i, 1 minus x sub i is 2i over n, quantity squared, and then times delta x, 2 over n. So I want to write this expression in essence, OK? I want to write this expression. So there we have. Uh, let's raise this to the power of a 2 gives us 4i squared over n squared. Let's distribute here, we get 2 over n. Let's distribute here, we get 8i squared over n cubed. Okay. So I believe it's pretty straightforward. We are going to put that in a format such that this can be used. So what do we have here? Summation of one. If you go back to summation, some of the summations that we have seen, the formulas in algebra. Summation of one is n as i goes from one to n. Summation of C is NC as I goes from 1 to N. Summation of I is N times N plus 1 over 2 as I goes from 1 to N. Summation of I squared is N times N plus 1 times 2 N plus 1 over 6 as I goes from 1 to N. Summation of I cubed is N squared times N plus 1 quantity squared over 4 as I goes from 1 to N. So we are going to separate this such that it had 1 C, C is a constant like 5, 2, whatever i, i squared or i cubed. So look at this one. I can write it, bring the two over n out. So I'm going to make up two summations, this one and the summation for that. This one is two over n summation of one. This one is eight over n cubed summation of i squared, of course, with a negative sign. So this part, again, I want to make sure you understand that this part is this one. This one with the negative sign is this. So I want to be absolutely clear as to uh, what's going on, everybody. Very straightforward. Now we are ready to replace the summation of one with n the summation of i squared with n times n plus 1 times 2 n plus 1 over 6. Let's do that. Remember, we want to take a limit. So we are interested in the first term. So first and foremost, this will simplify to 2. This one, the denominator is 6 n cubed. I want you to pay attention to the numerator. n times n, n squared times 2 n, 2 n cubed times Eight is 16 n cubed and a bunch more. Now, what happens is it is important to understand that the product of 
these pieces is 8n cubed. And then the rest of them go down in order, descending order of n. The reason I'm not interested in the rest of them because we are going to take a limit eight times. Uh, my apologies, this is two times, this is two times eight, which gives us 16. Now, this integral is the limit of this one. So the limit, we have to take a limit as n goes to infinity. So first I simplify, now I take a limit. This becomes two. This one, as you recall, because they both have the same degree, the answer would be 16 over six. So two minus 16 over six. And that is negative two thirds because Twelve over six minus sixteen over six is four over six. Negative divided by two, negative two thirds. So it becomes negative two thirds. Everybody again. I think it's pretty clear and uh, pretty straightforward. We are going to move on. So we went through the process of limit to find this. Now in this example, uh, we want to evaluate the Riemann sum for f of x equals x cubed minus 6x, taking the sample points to be right endpoints, and a is 0, b is 3, and n is 6. In part b, they want us to evaluate this. Now, what happens is, where we go through this process, it's an approximation of that. For this one, we're going to use the limit. So first and foremost, we want n equals uh, 6. This is the graph, everybody. And we want to go from a equals 0 to b equals 3, 1, 2, 3. So in essence, we want this shaded region. Let me, I'm going to clean it up. So shaded region and it's important to understand that when we go through the process because the function is not positive it's the difference of areas in other words this part is considered positive this part is considered negative clearly this is larger than that the result i don't know what the answer is but i should know it's negative roughly all right so first and foremost what is my function f of x is x cubed minus 6x what is my a zero what is my b is three, so we can calculate delta x as uh, p minus a over n, in this case, n is six, so three minus zero over six, and we get one half. Um, x sub i, X sub i is a plus i delta x. We're going to use it for the next page. But for now, what I want to do, I want to show you the easy way out, as I, as I mentioned. This one, I'm going to put a line segment that goes from 0 to 3. And I'm going to expand it so it becomes easy to work with. This is much larger than that for, for the sake of illustration. So this is 0 or a, this is 3 or b. And I'm going to cut it into 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 n equals six pieces. So when I divide, I get 0.5 or one half. So 0.5, 1, 1.5, 2, 2.5, and equals three. Now, what do we want to use? Let me want to use the right end points, everybody. Since we want to use the right end points, ignore the first point. So basically ignore this one. Let me grab my list. Ignore this one. So we want all of those, which means I want R sub six using this formula. Delta X is fixed as one as one over two. And then 
the height would be f of 0.5, f of 1, f of 1.5, f of 2, f of 2.5, f of 3. We don't have the first one because we are using the right endpoint. So uh, you really have over here this part, this part, this part, this part. So for this one, for example, this would be just roughly, I'll show you just two of them. The last one is easy to see. This is almost half. So this would be the rectangle with the height being f of this point or f of three, okay? And this one is 0.5. Is this one and this is one for example. So on and so forth. Okay. So I just uh, wanted you to see that. Looking like that. Let me erase my mess. So it looks like that. Okay. So one half times f of 0.5 plus f of one all the way to f of three. Now, just as an example, I'm gonna show you one of them. If I calculate f of one, it's one because that's actually easy. So let's, so what is f of one? That would be one cubed minus six times one, okay? If I want f of three, would be three cubed minus six times three, okay, and so on and so forth. We end up with a negative 3.9375, and note this value represents the difference of areas. That's why it's negative, everybody. That's why it's negative. All right. Now we actually want to evaluate this, which means we want an exact answer, which means we have to go with the uh, limit of the Riemann sum. So to do that, uh, the uh, delta x is no longer b minus a divided by six, but rather divided by n, okay? So this is again the same area we are talking about, okay? So now this time actually we will get this exact area, okay, exactly. So we have the function, we have the A, we have the B and delta X is B minus A over N, not six. And it becomes three over N. X sub I is A, which is zero plus I, times delta x, so 3i over n. So the integral is the, re the limit of the Riemann sum. And f of x sub i, we are going to replace it with 3i over n and delta x with 3 over n. So what is f of 3i over n? So basically this is your function x cubed minus uh, 6x. So uh, 3i over n to the third minus six times 3i over n times three over n. And by the way, uh, you can uh, simplify this expression. Remember we want to simplify this expression. And when we simplify it completely done, then we take a limit. So I'm not gonna carry the limit. I'm gonna just simplify that. First, let's plug in. And uh, three over N, uh, we put it in the beginning or at, at the end makes no difference, okay? Uh, so this one is 27, i cubed over n cubed. This one is minus 18 uh, i over n. 
So this part, three times 27 is 81 over n to the power of four i cubed with the, okay, so let's, so this part only, okay, is 27 over n cubed. 27 times 381 over n to the power of i cubed. Now this part, three times 18 is 54. So minus 54 n squared summation of i. What we are doing, again, take a look at here. We want to have one or c or i or i squared or i cubed because this summation, we know the answer. This summation, we know the answer. We are going to replace this summation with n squared times n plus one quantity squared over four. And this summation, we are going to replace it with n times n plus one over two. Okay. This integral is the limit of this expression as n goes to infinity. Now, for this expression class, this denominator is four n to the power of four. This one, I hope you see that this gets squared up. And this is n to the power of four, and then it's in descending order. n squared, actually this is easy to see, the next one is n, but even if you don't write, they go down in descending order. So for this one, we are going to have 81 n to the power of four in the numerator plus bunch more, the denominator is four n to the power of four minus 54 n squared. Actually that one is plus 54 n, but it doesn't matter, the denominator is two n squared and This is what we have. Okay, so. That's a negative sign. The highest degree term is n to the power of four for the top and the bottom. So the answer is 81 over four minus the highest degree term for the top and the bottom is n squared, so minus 54 halves. And when you do the math, you end up with negative 27 over 4 because this one is minus 108 over 4, so 81 minus 108 is minus 27. So as you can see, we can do it by the Riemann sum. Now, use the signed area interpretation of the definite integral to compute the integral of x dx from negative one to two. So what is the function? The function y or f of x is x in the interval of negative one to two. And f of x equals x or y equals x is a line through the origin. We wanna go from negative one to positive two. That means we want this area, we want this area. The difference is the answer. To find the difference of the areas, each one is a triangular shape. So we can use the formula A is one half base times the height. So for the green one, this one has coordinates two and two. Therefore, this distance is two. So is this distance. So the area is one half, two times two or two. For the red one, this has coordinates negative one, negative one which gives us the distance of one here, 
distance of one. So that's why positive half of one times one is one half, and their difference is three halves. And we are done. What I'd like you to do is at home show that this the integral of negative 4 to 1, 6, x dx is negative 45, and here's your function. Also, I want to quickly show you this concept, which is known as the FTC, and what it says, if you want to evaluate this, you can use FTC, and the advantage of that is, if the area fails, this won't fail, because this is a shape that you are familiar with, but if you are not familiar with the shape, how do you do that? Then you use the FTC or you have to do with the Riemann sum and uh, taking a limit, limit which takes forever. So here's the function we are interested in. The antiderivative is one half x squared because I'm evaluating from A to B, namely negative one to two, I don't need a constant because the constant will go away. And so one half, x squared, 2 squared, minus negative 1 squared. And I hope you see this is 3 halves. We will elaborate on this shortly as far as the definite integral is concerned and using the uh, FTC. Here's another example. We're going to use geometry to evaluate this. Uh, the square root of 9 minus x squared, take the integral from negative to 3, negative 3 to positive 3, so square root of 9 minus x squared dx. Uh, to come up with the answer, we need uh, a more calculus. So we discuss this concept in calculus too. But for now, we are not going to discuss calculus too. Rather, we're going to discuss area. It's easy to see the uh, function g of x is square root of 9 minus x squared. We want it over the interval of minus 3 to 3. And if we recall the equation of circles, okay, centered at 0, 0, x squared plus y squared is r squared, or x minus h quantity squared plus y minus k squared equals r squared. Now that we remember those, okay, so that's the general form. What I want you to concentrate on, if instead of g you call this y and then you square it, you get x squared plus y squared equals 9 squared because you get, if I square it, y squared is 9 minus x squared. And this is a circle centered at 0, 0 with the radius 3. So what is the graph? The graph looks like that is a semicircle of radius 3. Therefore, pi r squared is the area of a circle. Half of pi r squared, so circle, and we want half of that, half of that because it's a semicircle, where the radius is three. So nine pi over two is the exact answer. And for this, again, you cannot use calculus two. We are using the area. Some properties of definite integral. If you have a point, that means the integral of a to b, a to a f of x dx is zero because it it's delta x in essence is zero. If you have a point, it doesn't cover an area. Number two, the integral of f of x plus minus g of x dx, as it goes from a to b, we can cut them into two pieces as we did with the differentiation. So simply put, if this is f of x, this is g of x. This one is the area under the care for this one, assuming both of them are positive. This is the area under the care for the g of x. So if you put them together, it goes up by this much. So you add them up. So geometry can show that. 
scalar rule, if we multiply it by a number, we can take it out. So this is f of x, this is like two times f of x, okay, in the area under the curve. Dominance, if f is larger than g from a to b, then the integral of f of x dx from a to b is larger than or equal to the integral of g of x dx from a to b. So f is at top of g from a to b. Doesn't matter what happened afterwards, before a and after a, or after b. Just from a to b, then therefore, the this is larger than this because it covers the area under the curve. And we are assuming we are dealing with a, a positive function for now. Uh, bounding. Uh, if some number m, lowercase m, is less than or equal to f of x, and uh, f is uh, less than or equal to capital M, again, from a to b, then we been, when we multiply by b minus a, both all sides, in essence, that works out the same, because this is really is the same as multiplying by b minus a. So, uh, Here's the minimum value of the function. If you look at this function, the minimum value is here. So you draw a rectangle. And the maximum value of the function is here. You draw a rectangle. Obviously, the green rectangle has an area less than this blue area contains this green one also. And this um, almost uh, yellowish color has all the area from here down. Splitting uh, additivity, if uh, you are taking the integral of a to c f of x, the same as a to b f of x dx plus b to c f of x dx. Notice these two must be identical. And then from here, let me use a different color, from a to c. So be careful with that. So basically, this is from A to B. This is B to C. You can say it's from A to C, assuming uh, B is between A and C. And it really doesn't have to be. Opposite rules, the integral of A to B f of x dx is minus the integral of B to A f of x dx. A constant, if you have a C, just uh, the integral of A to B C d of x, because this will give you Cx from, B to, from A to B, so C times B minus A. Non-negativity, if f is positive, as x goes from a to b, this integral must be positive. All right, uh, now we know that uh, the integral of f of x dx, uh, when we go from one to three is given as six, three to seven is nine, one to three is negative four, we wanna evaluate the following. So the first one is one, two, three times three. So just multiply this one by three and you get 18. I think uh, pretty straightforward, just multiply it by three and there you have it, everybody. Uh, two f of x minus four g of x. So take the two out, take the four out and rewrite it in the following manner. Uh, we know this one is six, replace it minus four. We know this one is negative four, replace it. So two times six minus four times minus four. And of course, 12 and 16. The integral of one to seven f of x dx. So let's look at what we can do here. This is one to three, this is three to seven. So one to seven, this one plus that, right? Notice the intermediate one is the same, the beginning to the end, one to seven. So this is six, this one is nine, they add up to 50. Uh, three to one. Well, if one, two, three is this, uh, three to one is the opposite of that. Um, there you have it. I think it's very straightforward. Everybody should pay attention to this 
basic rules. There is really uh, not much to it. Okay, everybody. And um, that's all there is to it. FTC. The fundamental theorem of calculus is appropriately named because it establishes a connection between the two branches of calculus, differential calculus and integral calculus. And everybody remembers the area under the curve. It gives the precise uh, inverse relationship between the derivative and its integral. The ddx, the derivative of the integral of a2x f of t dt is f of x. In other words, whatever this one is, this is a number. And this is the variable that will replace the t. Because first you have to integrate this, then you have to differentiate. So in essence, they, have, they undo each other. Differentiation and integration, they undo each other. So the FTC theorem of calculus. Suppose f is a continuous function in the interval of a to b. If g of x is the integral of a to x f of t dt, OK? Uh, then g prime of x must be uh, f of x. If the integral of a to b f of x dx, then capital F of b minus capital F of a represents this, where capital F prime is lowercase f. That's the same thing. So in short, the integral of a to b f of x dx, which is the definite integral, which is a number, find any antiderivative and evaluate it at the end points f of b minus f, f of a. The difference, the answer. The derivative of a to uh, the derivative of the integral of a to x f of t dt is uh, f of x. To integrate this from zero to one, it's a definite integral, the answer is a number. So this gives you one over eight x to the power of eight. We don't need a constant. We plug in one, we plug in zero, and we get one over eight times, uh, one to the power of eight is one, zero to the power of eight, zero is one over eight. And here's the tip. Even if we use another antiderivative capital F of x plus c, in the evaluation theorem, the result will be the same capital F of B plus C minus capital F of A plus C, these two cancel each other, we get the same thing. That's why we don't need to write a constant. Uh, the integral of uh, one to D, two X to the power of minus one DX, first and foremost, I want you to notice this is the same as one over X, therefore it's a natural log. So it's ln two minus ln one, and as you know, ln one is zero. And ln2 is the answer, which is an exact answer. In calculus, we keep the exact answers, everybody. If we didn't use the absolute value, it wouldn't make any difference because the lower limit and upper limit are both positive. But I'm using the same question with different limits. But now we must use the absolute value because if we don't, ln of negative 1 is not defined because the domain is from zero to infinity for natural law. So we must use the absolute value here. So as you can see, this is ln one minus this is ln two. And again, ln one, you know it to be zero. So negative ln two is the precise answer. Uh, the integral of zero to power sine x dx, the derivative of sine is cosine, but the integral is negative cosine x. Uh, I'm going to keep the negative sign out, and I'm going to put the upper limit first, pi, so cosine of pi minus cosine of zero, and I keep the negative sign out. You know cosine of pi to be negative one minus cosine of zero is positive one, so this is negative two. The negative outside makes it positive.
we had done this before we found the antiderivative we didn't evaluate in this case of course because t this is t you want to be careful so we don't get x we get t plus sine t the derivative of cosine is negative but the uh, integral of that is positive sine t and we're going to put the upper limit first so power two plus sine of power two then we put the lower limit as you can tell uh, zero or sine zero makes no difference both of them are zero power two plus sine of power two is one and we keep it as such because it's an exact answer Well, just with the, uh, with the differentiation, first we are going to write this one as x to the power of one half, and this has exponent one. One and one half gives us exponent three halves. So five x to the power of three halves plus three x to the power of one half dx. Now we can use the power rule. And five divided by three halves plus one, x to the power of three halves plus one. Uh, three divided by one half plus one, x to the power of one half plus one. And believe it or not, this is the only calculus step you put the asterisk next to. And you're done. Now let's do algebra, we plug in four, one and so forth. And as you can see, this is five halves. So this is two, three halves. This is also two. Plug in four, evaluate it, minus plug in one, evaluate it. So when we plug in four, uh, four to the power of five halves, it means square root of four to the power of five, which means two to the power of five, which means 32, which means two times that is 64. Four to the power of three halves means square root of four cubed. But this is two. Two cubed is eight. Two times eight makes it sixteen. Um, one to the power of five halves or three halves makes no difference. They uh, are one. So two and two is four. So minus four, and they give us seven six. We want to evaluate the integral of f of x dx from negative 2 to 2, where f of x is defined as 2 when x is between negative 2 to 0 and 4 minus x squared when it's uh, from 0 to 2. Therefore, this has to use this uh, function, which is piecewise defined function. So we use the 2 from minus 2 to 0 and then from 0 to 2, we use 4 minus x squared. It's important to uh, understand what happens here, everybody. OK? The two pieces. Uh, this is very straightforward, 2x uh, from negative 2 to 0. This is 4x minus 1 third x cubed. So by the way, even if it was from negative infinity to zero and zero to infinity, we would use exactly the same thing, okay? So that will give us the same thing regardless. That's important to understand. So, as I mentioned, two x, and this one is 4x minus 1 third x cubed. So uh, again, let me put the asterisk next to it. This is the only calculus step. Now plug in. So what do we plug in? First, we plug in 0 minus, then plug in negative 2. This one first plug in 2, then plug in 0. So this is the evaluation, everybody, which we're going to look at in a moment. The 
Let's see what we have here. This is zero, don't worry about it. This is positive four. This is eight. This is minus eight thirds. This don't worry about it, this don't worry about it, right? So what we have is four plus eight, 12 minus eight thirds and 12 is 36 thirds minus eight. 36 minus eight is 28. So 28 thirds, very straightforward everybody. All right, we are going to move on. G of X is given as the integral of zero to X, one plus T squared DT. And we want to find the derivative of the function. And I'm going to show you this FTC we are going to use. Uh, we can use that if we are dealing with a continuous function. And f of t, which is the square root of 1 plus t squared, is a continuous function. Why is that? Because when you have a square root, it must be What's underneath must be larger than or equal to zero. As you know, this is always positive because it's one plus t squared. And therefore, it's continuous everywhere from negative to positive infinity. Therefore, according to fundamental theorem of calculus, all you have to do, replace the t with x. So g prime of x is the square root of 1 plus x squared, according to this FTC. So this says, if the bottom is a number, whatever it might be, and you want to take a derivative of this expression, just replace the variable in there with the x. d dx of the integral of 1 to x squared sine t dt. We want to take the derivative of this expression. First, the function f of t sine t. Then I'm going to remind you the derivative of a to g of x f of t dt. If this is x, we have the basic ftc and we're fine. But if it's a function of x, you have to replace the t with g of x and then times g prime of x. This is by the chain rule. So I'm going to show you two ways on this one so you've been exposed to that. First and foremost, just following that, replace the t with g of x, x squared. So you're g of x is x squared of it. So sine of x squared, and then the derivative of x squared, which is 2x, just following this formula. And of course, we put the 2x in front. I'm going to show you a second method, just for the sake of argument. And that means we are going to integrate this First, then we take a derivative of that. So the derivative 
We want the derivative of the integral of this. So what is the integral of sine minus cosine t evaluated from one to x squared? Please understand what I have here. What I have here is this. The integral of sine t dt from one to x squared. Sine gives you negative cosine t from one to x squared. So first we're gonna put x squared and then we're gonna put one. So never mind the differentiation yet. Let's evaluate this. So minus, I can keep the negative out, cosine of x squared minus cosine of one. Now I want to differentiate this term by term, the first one. What is the derivative of cosine x squared is negative sine x squared times two x. This negative, I'm going to keep it outside. This negative, I'm going to keep it outside. So cosine gives me negative sine x squared times 2x. Cosine 1 or cosine 5 or cosine of 2 pi over 3. This is some number. The answer for this one is 0, everybody. So again, this gives you 0. Cosine x squared gives you minus sine x squared times 2x. This negative sign remains. And I hope you can see that this is the same as this expression. So we prove both ways. So we prove using the formula that we have here. And let's say we don't have that formula. We don't remember it. Just integrate it and then differentiate. The advantage of this formula is if you have an expression that you don't know how to integrate, then you better stick with the theorem here. That's the theorem. So again, in short, if you're taking the derivative of the integral and the bottom is a number, the top is x, you just replace it with the variable. But if the top is a function of that, you replace it with that top function and then times g prime by the chain rule. What about here? In the same manner, Notice your function is tan t, everybody. So we're going to replace the t with this upper function x squared plus x. And then by the chain rule, time is derivative, which is 2x plus 1. So tan of x squared plus x. And then the derivative of that, 2x plus 1. And uh, normally we put that in front. Again, very straightforward. Now we have two functions with the lower limit as, as well as the upper limit are both functions. When the upper limit is a function, we have f of g of x times g prime of x. What happens when the bottom is then we expand it in the following manner. First of all, the function is t squared. Then we use this formula. If we are taking the derivative of f of t dt as we go from g to h, then if f of the top limit times h prime of x minus f of the bottom limit times g prime of x. So let's do this uh, step by step. f of t is t squared. So replace the t with sine. So sine squared x, that's this part. h prime of x, then the derivative of that, uh, the derivative of sine x, I mean, times cosine x, minus f of g of x, so replace the t with tan x, minus tan squared x, and then times g prime, here's your g. So let me just write that in case. This is the h function. This is the g function. And g prime, the derivative of tangent is secant squared. 
And uh, you can leave it like that, sine squared, cosine minus tan squared, secant squared, because it's as simplified as possible. Finally, uh, here's the case, and you remember that we have this formula, when the bottom is a number and the top is a function, it's the other way around. So we are going to write this as the same thing. We're going to interchange these two, and this changes to a negative sign. Okay, remember, f of t is this one, but we are going to put a negative sign, and we're going to take the sign as up, up and make it upper limit one, make it lower limit. This, we can use this formula. So we're going to keep this negative sign, one plus f of t is one plus t squared. So replace the t with sine squared. And according to this formula, I need g prime of x. I need the derivative of sine, which is cosine x. And now it's a good practice to put the cosine in front. And that's the final answer.